I still remember it like it was yesterday. Um, I was 14 years old, uh, first month of freshman year of high school. And the bell rang to dismiss us for lunch. And I can still, in my insides, feel the tension that I felt that day. The mix between a rising anxiety and a grumbling stomach. As I walked into the hallway to uh, where my locker was, I was almost positive that when I opened the door, I would find, for the third time that week, that someone had broken into my locker and stolen my lunch. And when my suspicions were confirmed by an empty brown paper bag, I figured it was time to kind of step aside from the embarrassment and, and tell someone. So that evening, I got the courage to, to tell my mom that someone had been stealing my lunch. And what I anticipated was her anger on my behalf. What I didn't anticipate is the strategy that she would employ to deal with this bully. You see, my mom, she, she packed my lunch every morning. So when I walked downstairs the next morning, I was a little bit surprised to see her packing two sandwiches, two bags of chips, two Tupperwares of fruit. We sat down at the breakfast table that morning, and she wrote a letter to the bully and said, listen, I don't know what's going on in your life. You, you might not have food for lunch, and you might be hungry as well. But I do know that my son is hungry, so if you would, take the extra lunch that I packed for you this morning and leave one for my son. And I want, I want to tell you that I was on board with this plan. <laughs> but I was angry because I wanted my mom to, like, take my side and like serve up some justice and give that bully what was coming to him. I wanted my mom to be a vigilante. As a 14-year-old, I wanted my mom to be Batman. <laughs> but it turns out that she was too busy imitating her hero and not mine. And so she showed that bully the kindness of God even when he didn't deserve it. Because she knew that the best way to turn something bad into something good was to show kindness. And in this way, she showed me that kindness and goodness are inseparable. My mom's the kindest person I know. And I've learned most of what I know about kindness and goodness from her example. But I've also learned a lot about it from Scripture. And so I'm excited to turn there together this morning and, and finish up our series called Fruitful and discuss kind of our final fruits of the summer. And I, yeah, I said fruits because we're double dipping this morning, if you can't already tell. We're doing a little bit of kindness and a little bit of goodness. My name is Jake Davis, and I'm the creative and digital pastor here at Mountaintop, and I'm, I'm honored to get the opportunity to, to speak from God's Word this morning and to learn together about these two fruits of the Spirit. I want us to, to have a little bit of clarity, though, as we close this series about what, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Why does this list exist? All right, so, so Paul, the man who wrote this, this letter, he wrote it to a church in Galatia, and they were struggling with this concept of what does it mean to be saved? And there was a group who thought that you had to follow Jesus and follow the Mosaic law, follow the laws that the Jews have followed for centuries. And there was a group of Gentiles who thought that as Paul preached, all you had to do was follow Jesus. All you had to do was give your life to Jesus. And so he writes this letter to them to help them kind of find some unity. And he puts this list of the fruit of the Spirit at the end as a way for people to help identify who are followers of Jesus. The whole thesis of the book of Galatians is that we are not saved by the blood that runs through our veins or the work of our hands. We're saved by the blood of Jesus and the work that he did on the cross. And so this list at the end of Galatians chapter 5, this fruit of the Spirit, the last thing I want you to do is to walk away from this series feeling like it's another list of things, attributes that you have to try your hardest to embody. Because Paul's letter to the church in Galatia was an attack against that type of legalism. 
This list at the end of Galatians chapter 5 about the fruit of the Spirit is not about moral effort. It's not about just trying to exhibit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's not. It's about a surrendered life. It's about the type of life that will come alive in you if you surrender yours to the leading of the Spirit. You don't have to try. The Spirit will do it on your behalf. In fact, you're incapable in your own flesh to produce the fruit of the Spirit. You need the Spirit imparting it on you. This is not just a list of things to do. It's a list of things that the Spirit does in our life when we give our lives to its leading. And, and we should know this because Paul tells us at the beginning of Galatians chapter 5 why he's writing this. He says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. It's, it's freedom. Surrendering our lives to the Spirit is freedom. Life in the Spirit is an invitation to, to living life abundantly. It's, it's life full of fruit, pleasant to the taste. But it's not just for us. The Spirit's intention is not some self-help model for life improvement. Our fruit is not meant to be hoarded, because fruit happens in community. This freedom that, has, that Christ has unleashed in each of us is for those around us as well. I mean, have you ever seen a tree eat its own fruit? No, because the fruit's not for the tree. The fruit's for everyone who might come and enjoy it because the, the tree produced it. The Spirit produces fruit in us for the benefit of others so that others might get a taste of the freedom that we have come to find in Jesus. So with that out of the way, let's, let's dive in this morning to, to what it looks like to tackle these two fruit, kindness and goodness. The fruit of the Spirit is, is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul says, against such thing there is no law. Kindness and goodness. And so the first question that we have to kind of answer this morning is, what does it mean to be good? What does it mean to be good in our lives? And any time we answer questions of Scripture, it is good for us to, to go into other parts of Scripture and try to find where it might answer this question itself. And so this morning we're going to start by looking at um, a verse in the book of Micah, a book written by a, a prophet named Micah in the Old Testament, where he tells us what goodness is. Let me set this up a little bit for you. We're going to be in Micah 6, verse 8. The verses leading up to this one are the musings of the prophet Micah, he's trying to determine how we might please God. He asks the question, like, what does one need to do in order to enter the presence of God? And he kind of concludes this list of musings with, what if I brought the fruit of all my labors, all my moral effort, all my striving to be good? What if I brought all of that? Would that make me good enough to be in the presence of God? And he answers the question, no. It's not enough. God is not pleased by our moral effort. It's all useless to the God of the universe. It doesn't even move the needle. You can't perform your way into the presence of God. But the good news is you're freely welcomed into the presence of God by God's kindness to you. And once there, God's kindness will transform you into something good. And so then Micah answers this question, what does it mean to be good? And he says, he has told you, let, let's go to Micah 6, 8. Let's read, the, let's read this. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. This is goodness. So what does it mean to be good? It means to do justice. Justice in uh, Scripture uh, is this Hebrew term, mishpat. All right? And, and it's a kind of a complex term that means multiple things. It's a comprehensive concept that covers legal judgment, justice, righteousness, God's law, ethical behavior, personal responsibility to care for your community. 
Goodness concerns itself with, with, uh, with doing what is just, what is right. To put simply, being good means doing what is right no matter the cost. So we do justice. We do what is right. Secondly, what does it mean to be good? We love kindness. Now, this term for kindness that Micah use, is, uses here is, is equally as important as mishvah. It's, it's a word called hesed. And hesed uh, is oftentimes translated as uh, God's loving kindness or mercy or, or steadfast love. But it's made up of many different parts, and, and our English language struggles to really nail down what, what hesed means. It's like an unconditional loyalty, right? Like you, you love someone um, and you're with someone despite their actions towards you. It's a covenantal love um, where it's often used in the, in the context between God and his people and the covenantal love that they share. It's, a, it's compassionate action. It's not, just a, it's not just a kindness that is inert. It has action and, and, it's, and, it's, and it moves in a forward direction. And then finally, it's, it's a comprehensive type of justice. See, has said and... and Mishvat, they're often intertwined with each other. You don't have justice for all people without kindness toward individuals. That's to say that what we show, when we show God's kindness in our everyday interactions, we're actually playing a role in enacting Mishvat or justice. When we show Hesed, we are enacting Mishvat. So perhaps a better way for us to translate God's mercy is this idea of generous friendship. This is the term I'm going with this morning. It's a generous type of friendship. And God shows us what that looks like. A generous friendship where it's born out of his covenant love for us as his creation. And he's generous in how he dispels his kindness to us. He walks with us like a faithful friend who extends his mercy. And he invites us to walk with him. So how, how do we be good? We, we, we love kindness. We do justice. And we walk humbly with God in relationship. Now, walking in humility looks a little bit different. It means that we walk not beside God, but behind him. He's Lord of our lives. We follow him. We imitate him. Because we've established that we can't be good enough on our own moral effort. We simply imitate God. And that's how we learn what it means to be good. We follow God, and in following him, we make space for his spirit to begin to produce good fruit in our lives. And as we grow closer to God, so also do our hearts grow closer to the concepts that are on his heart, like justice and kindness. And so, having answered that question, what is good, we're going to look at kindness this morning for the rest of our time together. And we're going to do so by looking at the story of a man in Scripture um, who, who showed this type of generous friendship. And let me say first, th- this, this man is not perfect. In fact, he's deeply flawed. And there are actually moments in Scripture that his morality is questionable at best. But remember, it's not about moral effort. It's about a life surrendered to God. And scripture tells us that this man is a a man who sought after God's own heart. He was accustomed to walking humbly with God. You might know by now I'm talking about King David. David was one of the most prominent kings in the history of Israel, a leader of God's people, and he led one of the most uh, successful regimes in Israel's history. While he was king, things were booming. But you need to know first that David was kind of an odd choice to be king. See, he didn't have royal blood in his veins, but God chose him anyways. He was a unique choice, and that's good news because we're all kind of unique choices, and God can still use us. So God chooses David to be king, but this creates a problem because there's already a king, and his name is King Saul. And he doesn't like that there's a new king that God has anointed that is in town. And so King Saul is threatened by David And much of David's life, King Saul is trying to chase him and kill him. In the midst of all of this, King David, before he's king, creates a relationship with Saul's son, Jonathan. And they begin to develop this kind of generous friendship with one another. At one point, Saul invites David over for a dinner party in 1 Samuel 20. And David's like, I don't don't think I'm going (laughs) to... I don't think that I really want to go to that dinner party. I know that Saul doesn't like me. And so he goes to Jonathan and he says, hey, Jonathan, I need you to look out for me, all right? So go to this dinner party with your family. And if it looks like your dad's upset, come tell me and I won't show up. 
So this happens. Jonathan goes. Saul's upset. He doesn't like David. And so Jonathan goes back and reports to David, like, hey, don't, don't show up to this dinner party. David doesn't. It enrages Saul. When Jonathan comes back to dinner, Saul is so enraged in his hatred for David, so angry, that he actually picks up a spear and throws it at his own son, Jonathan, nearly, nearly, nearly missing him, nearly killing him. Because he's just angry. So Jonathan goes to David. He's like, hey, man, I'm glad you didn't come. But I want us to make a covenant because it looks like things are getting pretty serious. And so they make this covenant at the end of 1 Samuel 20, and it goes a little bit like this. Jonathan says to David, he says, May the Lord be with you as he had been with my father. Now, it's important to note that this is basically Jonathan telling David that he supports him as king. The favor that was upon my father as king, I'm now transferring it to you. And this is significant because that's Jonathan's position. As the firstborn son of Saul, he's in line to be king. And yet he recognizes God's anointing that his father does not. He says, if I'm still alive after all of this shakes out, show me the faithful love that has said, the kindness, the loving mercy of the Lord. But if I die, never cut off your generous friendship from my home. Even if the Lord were to cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. Even if God eliminates all your enemies, would you show kindness to my family? And so we get to our text this morning in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And what has happened in the preceding chapters is that David has eliminated every one of his enemies. God has gone before David and he has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And so we would expect 2 Samuel chapter 9 to start like this. David asked, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul who I may wipe from the face of the earth? Because he's just dealing with his enemies one by one to make room for him to be king. This is Jake's fake translation, I think is what that stands for. Because that's not what it says, right? That's not what we find. What we find in verse 1 is actually kind of surprising. It says, is there any, still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? It's important for us to note that David has nothing to gain. He has nothing to gain from showing kindness to Jonathan's family. Because there's still sects in, the, in um, Israel who support King Saul, who are loyal to King Saul. And so embracing King Saul's family makes him vulnerable to some sort of coup from those sects. But David does it anyway. Why? Because the covenant that David made to Jonathan in generous friendship is more important to David than his conquest for power. David is still early in his reign, and his throne is still vulnerable to attempts at overthrow. Yet here we are. His covenant of generous friendship with Jonathan is David's motivation. It's clear from the rip that kindness does not take into consideration personal gain before it acts. So David asks this question, and Ziba, one of the servants of the house of Saul, says to the king, There remains one son of Jonathan, and he is crippled in his feet. And we meet Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan who, because of something that happened early in his life to him as they were kind of leaving the royal house as David was taking over, Mephibosheth got dropped and he broke both of his legs as a little boy, and now he is crippled in both of his feet. Mephibosheth literally means shame, or broken into pieces. It's a great name, right? Shame, or broken into pieces. And Ziba tells David that he's actually not in his home anymore. He's living in a place called Lo Debar. And Lo Debar loosely translates to like nothing town. He's in the middle of nowhere. So here's this man, this, this young man who was broken to pieces, full of shame. And he's living in this nothing town, the middle of nowhere. Can anybody relate to, to Mephibosheth? He's got no significance. Why, David? Like, Zeba's like, David, I mean, why would you show this guy kindness? Nothing's in it for you. I mean, really, like, no one would even know. He's a nobody. But David acts. One translation says, is there anyone who I can show in the house of, of, of David, who I can sh- or in the house of Jonathan, who I can show 
God's kindness to. Because David recognizes that it's not his own kindness. It's a kind of kindness that can only come from God. It's, it's countercultural. I mean, no good king in that day and age would be held accountable for dealing swiftly to remove his enemies. Kindness takes people off guard. No one sees it coming. This is why we need the Spirit in our lives to produce it. Because if we're honest with ourselves, none of us have a default setting of kindness. We know just as David that we are incapable of showing this type of self-sacrificing kindness in our own power. Well, don't miss the fact that David is free to show this type of kindness because of his friendship with Jonathan. Jonathan saved his life when he could have disregarded it. And because of that kindness, David made a covenant with him. And also, David has received the unmerited favor of God. So he has the freedom to show kindness, the kindness that God has shown him. He no longer has to be consumed by his own interests. I think a lot of us, we struggle with kindness because we're so consumed by our self-interest. But here's the thing about following God. Because God is kind to us, he has our best interest in mind. So we no longer have to lose lose sleep about our best interest because God's got it. The God of the universe wants what's best for you. And if he wants what's best for you, you can disregard your own interests and look to the interests of others. Mephibosheth comes before David, and, and David says to him, hey man, no, no, no need to be afraid, because he recognizes that Mephibosheth is in a compromising position. I will show you the kindness of God for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And then he says, I will restore to you the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you yourself shall eat at my table Always. Pretty simple. Kindness means restoring what has been broken. When uh, I was a little kid, my brother and I, he's a little bit older than me, we spent a lot of time um, at church because my parents were pastors. And um, at this church that we were part of, there was this one particular chapel that we were not allowed to go into because it was, uh, it was nice and it had nice stuff in it and it had ornamental kind of things all over the place. One time, my brother and I, we were playing wall ball, which is one of our favorite things to do. And we said, what if we went and played wall ball in that chapel over there? Sounds like a good idea to me. We were playing wall ball. My brother throws the first toss, and he hits this kind of ornamental vase, and it falls off, and it breaks, and it shatters into pieces. My brother and I are like, I don't know. What are we going to do? We just broke this vase. We're not even supposed to be in here, let alone playing wall ball in here. So finally, we worked up the courage to tell our parents. And... Uh, uh, we, were, we were so concerned how they were going to punish us. But they set us down, and I guess my parents liked writing letters. I don't know what this is about. We sat down, and they had us construct a letter to the man that was in charge of that chapel. Just writing, hey, hey we're so sorry. We broke this vase. Uh, we're, we're willing to pay to replace it. And then they were going to make us work to replace it. Because my parents wanted us to understand that kindness means being honest about the role that we've played in making things broken. David is the reason that Mephibosheth has lost his home. He doesn't have to, but he acknowledges his role that he had to play in that brokenness. And in our relationships, I know it can be hard, but if we're going to be kind to people, then we have to be willing to have the humility to own our mistakes to step forward into those relationships and just say, sorry. I've contributed to some brokenness here. And all of us have, right? We're all sinful. We all have brokenness inside of us. And so we all contributed to the brokenness around us. And we have to come to grips with the fact that kindness might just cost us something. I mean, I'm sure David had so many other plans for that land. But he restores it to Mephibosheth because kindness means restoring what has been broken. David continues on. He says, not only will I restore to you the land of your grandfather, but you yourself shall eat at my table always. 
Now, I want to draw a contrast here between the dinner party in 1 Samuel 20 and the one we're currently reading about. David does not come to dinner, and so Saul throws a spear at his own son. But here we have David, nothing to gain from the son of Jonathan, welcoming him into his house. So the question we have to ask ourselves, are, are we a people who are throwing spears or making space? Are we like Saul? Are we, are, we, are, we, are we more concerned with our territory and guarding what's ours, so we throw spears at those who are, who are not of use to us, or do we create space for them at our table? Because make no mistake, kindness means putting down our weapons and welcoming someone to the table. Kindness means we welcome people to our table. It means that we have a philosophy not of spears, but of spare seats. So who are you welcoming to your table? I want to pause a moment here, and I, and I want to make an appeal for, um, for our groups. Now, this is not an advertisement, all right? Let me tell you what, why we don't do groups here at Mountaintop. <clears throat> we don't do groups at Mountaintop because every other church does groups, all right? We don't do groups because we feel like you have uh, nothing on your calendar and you need another thing to do every night of the week. We don't do groups even so you can find a few friends. You've probably got friends. We do groups because we believe that something spiritual actually happens when we welcome someone into our home. That there's something spiritual that actually happens when we gather around a table together and make space for each other. And so I want you to consider what it would look like this fall to join a group. Because when, when you're in a group, your homes become a tangible expression of the kindness of God, and together you share God's kindness to one another. And, and we encourage each of our groups to kind of adopt this kind of spare seat mentality that I'm talking about, where there's always space for someone at the table to join them. And so I'd love for you to just start praying now. You can't sign up today. You can sign up in a few weeks. At the end of August, we're going to have group sign-ups. And I would love for you to have a few weeks to just pray about how God might be calling you to get into authentic community with someone and follow Jesus together, because I believe that right there is the point where you're going to, the kindness of God is going to become real to you through the kindness of another person, and then you're going to have the kindness flowing out of you to share with those around you. And so would you consider joining a group this fall? But I want to challenge you to take it a step further and adopt this mindset of a spare seat into your very life. Because we aren't called just to welcome each other to the table. We're called to welcome the world. And that's why the next part of this story is so important. It's so cool. Jonathan, Jonathan's son Mephibosheth is there, and he bows down in front of David. He says, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog such as I? I mean, why would you even notice me, David? I'm just a dead dog. David notices someone who no one else has ever noticed because David knows that kindness means seeing people for who they really are. Listen, there are people in your neighborhoods, at your workplace, in your social circles who are desperate to be seen. Not for the facade that they put on display in the office, not merely for the flag that flies in their yard, not for the charade that they play pretending that life is perfect. They want to be truly seen and truly known. And what would happen to our world if we did this? What if, we, what, what if we took God's call in our lives as followers of Jesus to seriously see people as he sees them, as priceless, valuable image bearers of the Most High God? I mean, not, not as, don't, don't hear me wrong, not as some mission project to be reclaimed, but as individuals who God already decided are precious by the price that he paid to redeem them on the cross. I mean, I have a sneaking suspicion that if we did this, if we adopted this as followers of Jesus, that it would be a better strategy to convince people to follow Jesus with us than ranting at them on our Facebook profiles that they've already blocked. Or harumphing another, every time another headline doesn't go in our favor. Or insulating ourselves from interacting with people who might disagree with us but still deserve the kindness of God? Could we truly see them? Because when we see people, we make it easier for them to see God. 
And that's what it means when we say that we're for Birmingham. That's what it truly means. We want so desperately for people to know that God loves them, that when they can't see that truth for themselves, we step into the world not with pitchforks or picket signs, but with armed with God's love so that through relationship with us, they might come to learn the kindness of God that we've experienced. The story continues. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. All the writer of 2 Samuel is telling us here is that David kept his promise because the lineage of Jonathan is preserved through Mephibosheth and Mephibosheth's son, Micah. David kept his promise because kindness means keeping your word. We're followers of God, and God is a God of covenant, and so that means that when we make promises, when we make covenants, we make good on them. You know that common phrase, that common saying, the path to hell is paved with good intentions? Kindness means making sure that our intentions and our actions match. So like God, when we make covenants, we take it seriously. We understand that our word carries weight, and so when we invest our word in someone, we make good on that investment. There's nothing less kind than abusing the trust of others. And so we care for people in the way that we take care of our covenants. And then, like, the story's over, right? The story's kind of of come to a conclusion. We see what happened to Mephibosheth. But no, 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 because the writer of 2 Samuel repeats something. And when anytime someone repeats something in Scripture, you should be like, why are we repeating this? He repeats in verse 13. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. It's like, you already told us this. Why are you telling this again? And the, and the reason is, as I researched, is because just a few chapters earlier, David goes on this conquest, and he's defeating one of his enemies. And once he, once he beats his enemies, he declares in 2 Samuel 5, chapter 8, he says, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house of David. There's no space for them in the kingdom of Zion. And yet here he is in chapter 9, changing his mind. Because the kindness of God in us might mean that we have to change our mind and check our prejudice. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, we have ways of thinking about people based on stereotypes or past experiences that are just toxic. But kindness prompts us to challenge those biases and see each person for who they are with a fresh set of eyes, the eyes of God, free from judgment. This requires deep humility, recognizing our fallibility, that we are sinners, and that our sin can even affect the way that we think about other people. Like David, you you may have established barriers in your life to certain people. Kindness looks like building a bridge so that others may find their way home. Are we willing to ask ourselves this tough tough question? In what ways have I been unkind in how I think about other people? And how might I push aside fear to make space to get proximate with people so that I might change those thoughts? Uh, Towards the end of my freshman year, um, many months after the missing lunch saga, I learned that about a week after I told my mom, she found out who was stealing my lunch. I was incredulous. <laughs> Why did you not tell me? But I was also curious. Like, what did you do? How did you, how did you deliver the justice? Like, how did, you, how did you give him what was coming to him? What was his punishment? I still to this day I have no idea who stole my lunch. And I have no idea how he was punished. Because my mom didn't want to create biases in my mind toward that person that might make it more difficult to show kindness in the future. She knew the toxic allure of the desire to label other people, especially those who hurt us, as bad. And she knew that giving me a new image of what a bully looked like would do more harm than giving me a new image of what kindness looks like. She wanted me to learn that kindness means getting close enough to someone to see what lays beneath the narrative that I've created in my mind about them. 
She wanted me to be free, to be kind. Because she knew that some people acted in unkind ways because life had been unkind to them. And what they needed was someone to show them the kindness that they didn't even realize that they were searching for. And you might feel like this. You might have been hearing this story, and you don't identify with David, but you relate to Mephibosheth. Because, I mean, life has kind of happened to Mephibosheth, right? He hasn't really lived it. It's kind of happened to him, and it hasn't been particularly kind to him. And maybe you feel the same way. Maybe you're like, it's me and Mephibosheth, just in a corner, all alone, from a nothing town, nothing to offer. The chaos of life has kind of followed you wherever you've gone. It's left you crippled, crushed, and broken into pieces. You feel alone. You feel like a dead dog, unworthy to even be looked upon. Listen, I'm convinced that many of us struggle to show kindness because we have yet to accept the kindness of God for us. The best thing you can do to produce kindness in your life is to allow the Spirit to daily remind you of God's kindness towards you, that even when life has not been kind to you, the creator of the universe wants kindness for you. That he holds out to you a life that, that is abundant, that, that, that his acceptance of you is extravagant, that his friendship to you is everlasting and unconditional, that ultimately he has been good to you any, even when life has been anything but good to you. Because listen, in the story of Mephibosheth, you might hear the whispers of the greatest story God has ever told. See, Jesus... Jesus was a king too. And like Mephibosheth was to David, you were his enemy. And like, he had no reason to come to you. Nothing to gain from you. Everything to lose. And yet he gives up his place as the king of the universe to pursue you. He sees you there, broken, shambles, pieces, alone. And he has pity on you. And he draws near to you. His first thought wasn't, well, what would this cost me? His first thought was, what can I give to make sure that they experience freedom? And then on the cross, he spread his arms to swoop down and pick you up off the ground and carry you to the table where you couldn't carry yourself and sit you at the royal table. No man was he good to you. Even when you didn't deserve it, he reset the scales of justice in your favor. He was so kind. <laughs> Even when you spat in his face and turned your back, he had mercy on you. And he makes it possible for you to walk humbly with him as a new member of the family of God. And just like the family of Jonathan, our names, because of what Jesus has done for us, are no, no longer cut off from the house and the family of God. And so if that's how you feel this morning, my question for you is like, would you just accept God's kindness to you? Would you just accept that he wants to show you some kindness this morning. And then think, how radically would your life change if you woke up every morning just kind of basking in that kindness, walking in the assurance of covenant with God, built on his goodness to us, rather than our, on our ability to reach some sort of goodness quotient, walking humbly, surrendered to the Spirit. Remember, because it's not about moral effort. It's about what the Spirit can do in our lives to produce this type of fruit on our behalf so that you can be free from the shackles of having to be good enough. You can't. That's the whole point of Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit. can't be good in our own flesh. We need the Spirit to produce it in us. That's the whole point of Micah chapter 6. There's nothing that we can bring before God that would please him. Only he can make us good. We have nothing to offer. But because he has offered everything to us by welcoming us into his presence, we now have the freedom that comes with God's Spirit a freedom to live a life of goodness. And when we find freedom from our flesh and instead come under the authority of the Spirit in our lives, we produce goodness. So would you just accept God's kindness to you? And you might say, like, Jake, I'd love to, but, I mean, you don't know me. You don't know my life. 
You don't know what's happened to me. You don't know what I've done. Listen, no matter what life has done to you, God's heart is always to show kindness to you. And the broken pieces of your life, make no mistake, they were not a part of God's plan. He wants you to be free and whole again. No matter what you've done, God's kindness is still for you. If life hasn't been kind to you, God promises to be. And if you haven't been kind, God's kindness can give you a fresh start. The the band's going to play a song to close us this morning. And I want you to take a moment to listen to the lyrics. Um, It speaks to this reality. And I want to warn you, it, it is brutally honest about the way that sometimes life has left us broken and then other times how we've contributed to that brokenness. But I want the refrain of the song and the chorus to be, be a reminder to you today that God is and always has been for you because he's a God of kindness. And so would you take a few moments to listen to the song and reflect on his lyrics as you reflect on the freedom that you can find in the kindness and the goodness of God.